welcome back to the to the Cosmic Bridge podcast with me, Michael Hansen. I have Tom Jenkins on, who uh, is part of the team here at the Cosmic Bridge. So him and I often riff on on different topics. You would have heard us in previous episodes talking about abstinence of alcohol, fasting, ayahuasca, which Tom has a crazy story with. Definitely recommend listening uh, to that episode. Um, but one of one of the reasons I set up the Cosmic Bridge is because I think we live in this very polarized world at the moment, or at least it seems that way when you're on social media. So I wanted to build bridges between different sets of people, different ideas that aren't talking to each other. And the topic of today's show is going to be around that of nationalism and globalization, because actually you can be pro-nationalism and you can be pro-globalization at the same time, in my opinion. But often we're taught that's not the case, that if you're patriotic, if you're proud to be American, British, German, French, Ghanaian, whatever it is, that, that you're racist because you you believe in a nation. But I don't think that's the case. And I think a great example, you know, Tom, you're a, a football fan as well, but like in the UK, when England are playing, you get so many people that feel patriotic and feel English, and they're just people that have grown up in the country, but they could be black, they could be Asian um, or Asian British, but they, they were born in the UK and they, they feel British and that's all, or English that I show you when it comes to football. And that's a really good example of, um, you know, you can be uh, patriotic, but that also ties into globalization because their parents moved here, you know, maybe 50 years ago, 100 years ago, whenever it was, and, and they, they feel very, very English um, in that sense. And I think this really comes down to you see a lot of stuff online now of uh, just just real extremism when it comes to polarization. And funnily enough, to turn it back to a personal note, I was thinking about this topic, and I think I actually texted you about it, Tom, because I was going through Chicago airport. And whenever I go through Chicago airport, I always think about the film Home Alone, because um, if you've seen it, Kevin in Home Alone lives in Chicago and there's a scene in the first uh, Home Alone. And essentially, there's this scene where there's all these flags. And there used to be international flags of all these different countries when you run through this part of Chicago airport. And I've been to Chicago five years ago, and the flags were exactly how it was, all these different international flags. And anyway, when I went last year, I noticed that the flags are now all American. And in my head, I didn't think I was kind of neutral about it. I didn't think this was good or bad. I just thought, hey, it's good to be patriotic. It's good to be pro-American, right? I'm not American myself, but I can appreciate that. And it's also good to show the flags of of all these different countries. Um, but I think you can be you can be pro-globalization and uh, pro-nationalistic at the same time. But of course, there's negative sides to both. But yeah, maybe we, I know Tom, you've, you've been on your own personal journey with this. Maybe we can come to you at this point. Yeah, so the first thing to say is I'm recording this podcast from near Medellin, Colombia, which <laughs> is which is where I've been living for six years. So clearly the fact that I'm here is because of the, the globalization and what's been made possible by air travel visas. I mean, obviously it was possible in the past, but now it's just a few clicks of a button and 12 hours from the UK, you're in Colombia. So and this is where I'm home. I'm married to a Colombian. Um, I own land here. I have a huge natural project here. And it will be where I, where I think I'll be for the rest of my life. So what globalization's done for me, and, you know, it's a pretty generic example, this one, is, is huge. And I have a lot of Colombian friends, but I also have, you know, two of my best friends here are British and Bulgarian. So... It's there's also that very much international community and local community here as well that ties in together. And I used to be someone I used to be very pro just and I still am in a way, you know, flying around the world, going wherever you want, um, completely open to everything and sort of more. Kind of, I guess, a more much wider consumerism style of it. And as I've gone on now, what I see is there's this term glocalization, and everyone likes making these, these, these stupid new terms these days. But I think it kind of makes sense in a way that the food I eat, I grow a lot of my own food, um, organic permaculture. The eggs I buy are supporting a local farmer up there. The chicken I eat is supporting a local farmer up there. And with this natural reserve project we have, we try and keep 
all the employment, everybody working for us is we're in the in the local village. So it's sort of looking at how I guess we've gone away from uh, nationalism here, but how you can yeah. make the best of your local environment as well as taking the benefits from a global world. And if we tie it back into kind of how how I feel with my national side, I used to be a raving British football, English football fan. I've been to two World Cups following them. And I used to love that side of things, but then I couldn't care less about the cut. Like I wasn't, couldn't really care less. I'm British. I'm English. That only mattered to me in sport, and it didn't really. None of the other side of it. I don't know the royal family or this or that. Really came to me, and I guess, you know, I am now more proud to. I, I'm always proud when I say I'm from England because it's it's a great country with so much going on, so many. You know, and obviously there's the problems that you get in everywhere of the world. But you compare the health system and the education system in in the UK to Colombia. Now, of course, it has its huge cracks, but actually, in comparison, Colombia could only dream of of the environment that we grow up in and that's possible nowadays. So. That's kind of a, a long rounded version of my story, but very much exactly as you say, seeing the benefits of the local life, the global life and the national life kind of tw entwined together. And there's going to be positives and negatives of it all. But we have to talk about it and open this up rather than, oh, you voted for Trump. You're a racist. You voted for Biden. You're a, I don't know, you're a, a liberal. Right, a white right liberal, yeah. 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 And it's, it's not that. Sure, of course, there are some people who vote for Trump who are racist. Yeah. And of course, some who vote for Biden who are who are crazy leftists, socialists yeah. with some extreme views. But most aren't. And we just need to kind yeah. of get back to what connects us. Yeah, it's also funny because there's so many nuances when I think about Trump and Biden. Supposedly, Trump is the you know right wing in inverted commas. I don't even think right and left exist anymore. But in in the traditional sense, the right wing guy with the family values, but actually he's had like lots of broken marriages, lots of kids with different people. And Biden is the guy who's supposedly like the left woke guy, but he's actually like stayed in a stable relationship right and there's loads of bad things i can say about biden as well and bad things about but often there's they they have more in common than they think and it's almost like the system itself is the thing that's that's saying and i think we have the same problem in the uk as well which is you know it's there's basically two parties and the whole system is designed around polarization because we can say now that social media is to blame or the media but literally the political system in itself is designed about two parties like basically having a go at each other and saying hey this is what you're doing wrong and i think i discussed this on a on an episode with uh with my friend james Honda pinder who's a big like storytelling consultant and because he said i know you like don't like discussing politics on the podcast and one of the reasons i don't like discussing politics is because my problem with politics is it's never around what are the problems and how do we solve them it's just pointing finger at the other person and saying hey you're the problem right versus we're all the problem and how do we get around this together and i think that goes into like you know the nationalism globalization part because a big thing at the moment is identity polit politics which is you're a bad person because you're white black muslim christian whatever it is right versus um hey yeah we do live in a globalized world but it's also okay to be proud to be english to be proud to be chinese or whatever it is right I don't, those things in themselves aren't bad and yeah i just think the the world's the world's become a bit crazy in that sense yeah for sure and i think i think you've discussed this on other podcasts with sam flynn and the episode we have uh, had on um the news uh Yes, or, Jody Jackson, yeah. Yeah, talking about how actually the news is, and social media almost more so is almost, the way it's designed is almost negative, negativity kind of spreads more reaction and more. So when you go on social media, especially, I, I've never been on Twitter or X, but, you know, if you start to look, it's kind of, 
it looks like the world's incredibly divided because you get a lot of the extremism on there as more of the, the I guess, the censored or neutral, I don't know what the word is, people, just the kind of staying away from that when really that's not the case. Again, obviously, there are some, you know, there is polarisation and some bad people, but the things we connect to us, I think you said it yourself, you go out on the streets in London and 99% of what you see is happy people getting along, mm smiling in the street and you know these these crazy problems don't exist but almost the news and social media spreads spreads a lot of that polarization and, and negativity yeah and i think going into a different episode was we did um one of our most popular episodes on youtube uh i did an episode with a psychiatrist that represents people on death row and mass murderers and he was talking about jung's um concepts of the collective unconscious which is we're all connected to some kind of higher spirit or or god or, or or whatever you think whatever spiritual beliefs you have now if that's the case right if you really believe in this collective unconscious or you believe in god or you believe in a connecting spirit you have to see yourself in everyone however dark that person is and i know someone like jordan peterson always says especially for us as like white europeans most people imagine themselves as like the person in the concentration camp, whereas we should be thinking, how would we be the the God, the Nazi God, right? Versus the person in the concentration camp. So actually think of ourselves as the perpetrators versus the victims. And that's just one scenario. You can do that in any any situation. But the, the reason that I'm bringing this up is um, I try to think of this as well, because like, I think we were talking about this before the show, Tom, like as you get older, naturally you probably become a little bit more conservative with certain things i would say for me it's not really with like economic beliefs i would still say i'm very skeptical of the whole like economic system that that we've built and we could probably do a whole show on pharmaceuticals and all, all these things as well right i'm definitely skeptical of that but certainly i would say i've become more conservative with family values and i just think that's kind of a natural process as you get older some people have their own families and they get married and and all that stuff right and you start to emphasize empathize with with your parents and then but what happens i think is as you go through this journey and it's definitely happened to me sometimes you look at the younger people and this is how you say oh these left leftists these woke is like the new inverted commas and even though i actually agree with a lot of the people that are saying that type of stuff i think the language they're using is very antagonistic and what they should be thinking is maybe i was actually a little bit like that at university you know people are a bit like more left-wing etc when they're younger and like as they get older they change so you should be trying to see yourself in the other person everyone's a bit of like an activist right because activists you know in the whole like right wing uh anti-woke culture activist in itself has like become this like negative term but again i don't agree with like trans activism and a lot of these things and like hardcore veganism activism I, I don't agree with a lot of this stuff but i still see sometimes i look at people like that and i see my younger self in them so we shouldn't always be judging them we should try to have a conversation with them because i think that's what's happened is the anti-white people in inverted commas they're like the anti-cancel culture but the funny thing is they're canceling as well so like both sides are as bad as each other like we were saying about the you know the polarization piece yeah, it's interesting you're talking about how we have to keep talking to keep and keep an open dialogue to to keep everything open. And exactly as you say, I've gone through that exact same same cycle as you from, yeah, slowly becoming more and more conservative when I get older. But I recognize my younger self and everything you're saying. And there's somebody, a guy on YouTube. Now, I'm not necessarily his biggest fan, but I like... I like the principles that he tries to promote. He's a guy called Charlie Kirk, and he can be quite controversial. What he does is he goes to universities and debates topics, and he just sits there with a sign in front of him saying, I believe this, debate me. And he's quite conservative. And what you have is some very woke liberals who come and start swearing and screaming in his face. Now, this guy sat down in a completely calm posture trying to discuss these issues and he's saying the day we stop discussing these issues look i have these views you have these views but if if we cannot sit down and talk in a reasoned way 
that's when the fabric of society breaks down. So I'm not necessarily saying I agree with everything he's saying, but no. the fundamental message he approaches it with is just sitting down in a calm way to debate quite radical students is phenomenal. But it's, and I suspect a lot of going back to social media, what he puts out is the controversial debates he has because they're the ones that get hundreds of views or many thousands of views. And sort of if somebody comes and has a reasoned view, it probably doesn't get seen very much on YouTube. So maybe that's even exacerbating it as well. But it's it's very much that balance of, of coming back to dialogue. And I know a clip you love, you sent it to me from that documentary Human um, mm -hmm. from the yeah. the Israeli Israeli guy and the Palestinian guy um of both of them had uh lost lost their children through complete they were you know one through through a suicide bombing and one was just playing and they weren't part of the conflict and both these fathers chose to forgive and to encourage peace we'll uh we'll drop the link to that short clip in in the description yeah. so you can have a have a look at it but it's an incredibly incredible example of forgiveness through the toughest of losses yeah another another, another um example we can put in the show notes uh, as well there's um there's a documentary i watched it on netflix i think it's still there i'll have to look at that tom called accidental courtesy and the guy i've forgotten his name the guy have you seen that tom accidental courtesy no i haven't no oh uh, so i can't remember the guy's name now unfortunately but he's um He's a black American guy. He's like a, a blues, I think he's a singer or in, in a band, but he's quite famous in the blues world. And what he does, he goes around the US and he speaks to uh, people in the Ku Klux Klan. And through this process, because he's like such a nice guy. And again, he he thinks the way we think, he's like, you have to have conversations with people. You can't just cancel people. Even if these people at a deep, even if they think at a deep seated level, they want to kill me because I'm a black man, right? He goes, he hangs out with them, he has lunch, he has coffee, they talk. And then these people realize, oh, how can I hate someone like this? How can I be up part of this organization that hates someone like this? And they end up retiring from the Ku Klux Klan. They give him all the gear with the robes and stuff. So this guy in his house, he basically has a room of all this Ku Klux Klan stuff. Now, interestingly, what's sad about this is because this guy is trying to create dialogue, he now gets hate from both sides, right? Because he gets hate from people who are still in the Ku Klux Klan who haven't met him. And then he's also getting hate more from like Black Panther type people saying, how can you be engaging in the Ku Klux Klan? But actually what he's doing is incredible. Like I'm trying to do on this podcast, he's trying to build bridges um, between people. And it's another great example of like, you were talking about the Israeli father and, the, and a Palestinian father. And it's like, no matter what conflict you're you're looking at, You've always got to try and see the other side of it. And it's interesting. I'm reading this book called The Art of War at the moment, which is a very ancient Chinese book. I think it's 500 years older uh, than the Bible, supposedly. And that, and, it, and it's in the actual Bible as well, which is like you have to understand your enemy, right? You can't just be like your enemy's bad, your enemy's this, and you can get into the whole thing about like projecting evil. And the thing is, we don't we don't want to understand our enemy anymore. And even if you're looking at it not from like we're talking about actually, let's make a better world, let's make a more peaceful world. Even if you're looking at, I want to defeat your enemy. The best way to defeat your enemy, and this is what it's saying in the book, is actually by understanding your enemy. But we don't want to understand people that have different beliefs to us nowadays. And I, I, you know, I think that's a really sad thing. Yeah, for sure. And I'm I'm really interested to to check out that program now. A friend was actually telling me something similar. I forget the name. I'm going to ask him and see if I can put it below. But there was a very, either it was a very left-wing viewpoint, a comedian who has a very left-wing viewpoint who went out to meet people with very right-wing right viewpoints um, or the other way around. And actually all, all she discovered in the journey was exactly as you said at the start, we're so much more connected than we think. And those left and right wing views often, you know, they're, they're very similar. And when you open that dialogue seems to be the key thing of the podcast that it, it all comes back. And, you know, taking us to a personal journey about 
10 years ago now, I volunteered in a refugee camp in France called The Jungle. Uh, I don't think it exists anymore now. I'm not sure. But right on the Calais border. And there were 10,000 refugees living in horrible environments, you know. And there were also the police there. Now, I was a volunteer for the refugees, so I was kind of on note their side. And, you know, there was huge hate from sort of, in, in inverted commas, our side towards the police. And there was huge hate from the police towards our side yeah. because there were so many conflicts. Now, when I actually look back now, you know, I can understand both sides. Obviously, I still fully understand the refugee side. I've I spent many times, you know, here in Colombia supporting Venezuelan refugee, um, you know, uh, initiatives still. I still do. But on the other side, you have to understand that these people are trying to keep. There was a huge increase of violence from some as in any bad, any group anywhere in the world. There are always going to be some bad people. It doesn't matter, financial world, spiritual world, refugee world, who cares? Now, because of this huge influx of refugees who have very little, there was a lot of crime, a lot of burglaries in the area, a lot of people being robbed at the same time, a lot of trucks getting vandalized by people trying to get onto it. So what these policemen were trying to do is were trying to protect that from happening. Now, looking at it now, I can completely understand that. Now, were there some yeah. bad people who did some bad things in that from the policemen too, of course. But I can really see the different sides and how 10 years ago I was sort of very extreme on your terrible people, how are you doing this, these poor vulnerable people? Mm. But there really are two sides to it. Yeah, it's 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 great to have that that self-reflection as well. And I think uh a lot of people don't have that, unfortunately. And I think it's yeah, like like we were saying earlier, as you get older when you're complaining about the snowflake generation, as people say now, we, we talked about in the Michael Chapman episode, actually, you know, seeing your, seeing yourself uh, in that person. And um, yeah, I think for, for me, a real takeaway of this podcast, if you're listening uh, to it, and I'm, I'm going to think about this myself as well, is try and get in touch with someone who you know has an opposing belief to you. Because even if we don't agree with it, it's actually going to at least help us have a bigger picture of the world that we live in. Oh. Yeah, it, it couldn't be more true. And, you know, it's it seems to be, you know, the next crisis after the next crisis. You know, a year ago, we were at Ukraine, Russia. And now, you know, everyone's all, almost... I was, I don't want to say forgotten about that, but seeing as the next big crisis has come along, let that go. But, you know, what are what are also some of the incredible things or, or better put how in your episode about living in Medellin and Christmas, actually, instead of getting to all those negatives, what good could we do today? Just one little thing. And, you know, could it be just saying hello to a homeless person? Could it be just buying them lunch? Could it just be that one act of kindness that actually can help just help open the doors, you know? And there's a saying, if you heal yourself, you can help heal the world. And, you know, part of healing your world, yourself is being of service to other people. And just look at one thing, one thing I, you, he, she can do today to help open up that light. That's a really great way to end the show. Um, I always say this on every show, so you're probably bored of hearing me say it, but please subscribe to us on YouTube across the podcast platforms because uh, it really helps. And as always, share it uh, with any friends who you think um, could be interested in it. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>